What's going on, people? Welcome to another episode of the Get a Bucket Podcast with me, your host, Chris LeBron. We're waiting for our guy, Kev. We know he's out on the West Coast. I don't know if I told him the wrong time or whatever, but, <laughs> you know, we're waiting for him to get back. But we got a special, special show for you today. We got a legend, Michigan State legend, former first round pick, Maurice Ager in the building. What's going on, my brother? What's the word, bro? Appreciate you, dog. Thanks for having me, dog. We outside. No. Yep, yep. I appreciate you coming on, man. It was, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people looking forward to this show. So I'm looking forward to chopping up with you and talking about a little bit about, you know, your, your time, you know, growing up Michigan and all that and your time, you know, going to Michigan State and then your time in the pros. But, you know, before we start, how you been, man? How's everything going? How's life? Man, life is wonderful, bro. Like life is progressive. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's dope. You know what I'm saying? We're learning through our ups and downs. And uh, we making things happen, dog. So it, it's a cool, it's a cool deal, man. You know, I'm out here, I'm out here living in Asia, so it's a, a bit of a, uh, it's a bit different, but you know, I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm about an hour. I'm saying I'm not an hour, but uh, man, I'm sure I'm a day ahead of y'all. So it's a, uh, it's all good, dog. So, so what made you want to go to Asia? Um, you know, you know, I, I moved out here in 2017, dog. Okay. Uh, you, Completely honest, bro. I feel like my chapter was complete in America, dog. And I kept getting opportunities to come out here in Asia to do different things, you know, basketball wise and and work with different companies in terms of like, you know, youth programs and stuff. So it's just mm-hmm. like, you know, I just kind of disevaluated where I was at. And I just feel like, you know, I, there was no, I feel like I hit a ceiling mm-hmm. in America. I feel you. And, you know, I, I just wasn't really feeling where the country was going at that time either. So I was like, yo, this is my opportunity to be, you know, you know, be out of here, you know, and, and, you know, start a new chapter in my life. So, you know, Asia came around at a very important time in my life, man, and I needed it. And it was life, it was like it was life changing. It still is, and um, I'm grateful that I'm here. And uh, yeah, I'm not here, bro. Real yeah, that's real. a that's a big move. I mean, I think we all all everyone in life goes through that where you know you feel like you have to make that change, and you mean that's a drastic change. That's not like going to like a different state or a different city or a different county. You're going to a whole different country. So yeah. when you did that, you know. Where you like, man, this is, uh, th- this could, this could backfire on me. You know, w- w- were you willing to take, you know, the risk with that, knowing that it could backfire? Uh, yeah, shit, I'm, I'm definitely a risk taker. You know what I'm saying? So I never thought about it backfiring at all, bro. That was never a, a, a part of my, my mental going into it. You know what I'm saying? I actually knew that. I'm like, yeah, this is. I'm not looking backwards. I feel like mm-hmm. I'm going forward from this point. And it felt like that, you know, even at the airport, I was like, yeah, yeah, this is it. Like, I felt good, bro. When I landed mm-hmm. here on this Asian soil, bro, it just felt like a new life for me, dog. So, um, you know, I me, mean, I left the NBA, you know, at a very pivotal time. So it was like, I'm, I'm you know, I'm pretty known for, like, taking risks. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I feel like that's just what it is, bro. So, uh, and I'm glad I took that risk. And I'm glad I'm a risk taker, man, because it takes a lot of bravery in order to take risk out here to, to, um, to achieve certain things outside of your comfort zone, bro. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I've had to learn that myself. You know, sometimes you get we get so comfortable in a certain position, but sometimes you got to take those risks. You got to take those risks yeah, and, sure. and and just, you know, whatever happens, happens. You know, sometimes, you know, you just don't know. But let's talk a little about your 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 hoop journey and all that, because you got a very, very great story and all that. So what was the first time you fell in love with the game of basketball? Oh, uh, yeah, I guess around seven, eight years old. You know, say my sister's. Boyfriend, you know, she ended up marrying him. My guy Antoine, you know, he's a uh, my brother-in-law. You know, he introduced me to professional hoops in college and stuff like that. You know, before that, I was just playing around the neighborhood in Detroit and stuff like that. But he actually showed me that it was a, it was actually a, a route to get into a certain level in basketball. And I feel like I fell in love with the NBA and all that stuff at a very young age, just because I saw how, you know, um, it was so prestige, man, at a at a young age watching NBA games, Pistons and you know, Michigan, Michigan State, college games and stuff like that, watching guys on TV. You know, and this is where – this is around the time where TV was pop. TV was TV, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Back when, you know, it was a big deal to be on TV. So I'm watching people play basketball on TV. It was already kind of like, you know, pretty uh, pretty out of sight for me, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, damn, I want to I wanna, I wanna be one of those guys. So, yeah, it was definitely around that time, seven, eight years old. Who was the – was there was there a team? Was it a player that made you you know be like, oh wow, this is uh, I like this? Yeah, I would definitely say like the Pistons at that time. Uh, you know, uh, I remember you know I was born in '84, so I, I had an opportunity to see the the back to back Pistons. So, you know, I, I felt that energy. You know, uh, that was pretty 
it was popping in Detroit at that time. So, you know, guys like Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars, you know, those guys really made it um, made it a thing. You know what I'm saying? It was really something to look forward to. You know what I'm saying? And of course, Mike Jordan. And then, you know, the 5-5, five, five, like, you know, those moments were very pivotal in, in terms of, you know, my development as a, as a youngster and wanting to, you know, tap in on that NBA life, dog. Mm-hmm. You know, going to college, you know, watching Hoop Dreams, bro. Like, Hoop Dreams was huge, dog. Like, that came out in, like, 91 or something like that. Yeah. So when I saw that, you know what I'm saying, and saw the process, you know, I fell in love with, you know, wanting to, like, get recruited. And, uh, you know, so, yeah, that, that did a lot for me, dog, early on. All right. So when was the first moment as, you know, you starting to play basketball? Like, what was the first moment you were like, OK, I, I think I'm good at this? Uh, I feel like I was always athletic. I always had like a certain level of skills, you know, saying natural ability. Um, I, I would definitely have to say around, you know, uh, you know, 11, 11, 12 years old. I, I, I didn't, honestly, I didn't start playing organized until I was like 12, dog. So. Mm-hmm. Once I started playing organized, you know, I pretty much knew I was going to be one of those one of those guys, bro. You know, and that's what I wanted for myself. You know, and, and how was the basketball scene? You know, in 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 Michigan and all that. Was it, you know, were you playing against you know guys that were you know D one caliber players or you know guys who were future pros and all? Or just talk to me about the scene and all that. Uh, definitely. Once I got to high school, you know, what I'm saying middle school, we had some some pretty solid players, but. You know, um, you know, a lot of guys didn't translate even over to high school. You know what I'm saying? You know, some guys played freshman, JV. But, um, yeah, definitely in high school, bro. Shit, you know, the, the, music, the Michigan basketball scene was off the, off the chain, bro. Like, you know, you had some of the greatest players at that time. You know, guys like Kelvin Tolbert, Marcus Taylor, Anthony Robeson. You know, um, who else was popping at that time? Olu Famantini, Brandon Jenkins, Deion Harris, Ricardo Billings. You know, Detroit alone, man, the PSL was one of the toughest leagues in the mm-hmm. country, bro, in terms of just, you know, toughness, and just hungry, hungry dudes from the city, dog. So, like, every game was a uh, was a, was a death match, bro. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like, the city was cracking, dog. So, you go to a game, it'd be – I know you've seen above the rim. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, you, had, you had a – we had our birdies. We had these <laughs> with the with the pistols and, mm-hmm. and um, the, game, the games used to be roped off. So, it was pretty intense, dog. So, yeah, that's just on the city level. You know, and as far as statewide, you know, you had guys like, like I said, Anthony Robeson. He was cold. He went to Florida, played in the NBA. Paul yep. Davis, he went to the NBA. And, um, you know, out of that lineage, you know, I feel like you know, yeah, I think I was the only one that went first round. But for the most part, you know, you had guys that came up after that. Jordan Crawford, you know, Chris Douglas Roberts. Mm-hmm. You had guys like, uh, man, shit, the list goes on. You know what I'm saying? But, yeah, the Michigan basketball scene is cracking, bro. We always in the mix in terms of some of the um, best players in the country. Talk. I want to. I want to ask you about this as far as like that's the scene, the high school scene. Obviously, what we see now, you know, with just the the growth and social media and all that. And we just see the, you know, we're always seeing highlights and all that. Right. We, everyone got a highlight package and all that. And, yeah. and uh, what what do you think for, for you growing up, you know, playing in, in going into that high school scene? What do you think to you was the biggest adjustment, you know, going from playing, you know, you know, playing middle school, then going to that high school level and all that. When, especially in the era where it's not, you don't have all the, this, the, the, you know, you know, there's not all these ballers' life. There's not overtime and all that to to find you and all that. Where like we're seeing now, like everybody got a mixtape and all that, and everybody got highlights and all that. So for me, what was that? You know, trying to get noticed and all that. How how did you go about that? Yeah, it was a thing called Press Spotlight. It was the magazine, dog. It was, it was the number one ranking magazine in uh, Michigan, you know, it was run by a guy named Vince Baldwin. And, um, you know, he used to do ranks out of classes, you know, he did uh, all state ranks and, you know, just pretty much ranked the top players in the country. I mean, I'm sorry, in the state and in the Midwest for that matter. So that was pretty much our bridge point. You know what I'm saying? I remember going into my freshman year, I wasn't ranked at all. And um, I made that a, a point, you know what I'm saying? Like I was obsessed with getting ranked, bro. Like the guy who actually did the publication, he went to my, he actually was an alumni to the high school that I went to my freshman year. And once I figured that out, you know, so I tried to figure out like people who knew him and one of my best friends, um, Blood, his dad was actually really cool with him at that time. They played at Michigan. I'm not sorry. Um, at Southfield High together. I'm sorry. I'm tripping. They played at Southfield High together. So I was doing the best I could to get to Vince Baldwin so he can come out and watch the play. Like mm-hmm. I wrote, I remember writing him a letter, bro. True story, bro. I wrote him a letter when I was in freshman, dog, freshman year. I'm like, yo, I'm one of the best players in the state. I'm one of the best freshmen in the state. And one day I will be the best player in the state. And, um, Lo and behold, bro, 
Uh, our clients went through our ranks in Michigan, became one of the top five best players in the state, number one shooting guard in the state, and I'm going to Michigan State. And uh, he publicized me um, in the magazine. You know what I'm saying? He had my old ass letter that I wrote to him in ninth grade, me talking about some of the things that I actually brought to life. And I ended up being on the cover of that magazine, bro. So um, instead of us having all of this, the ball is life. It's so many different avenues here to get yeah, seen. Yeah, it's crazy. We had a magazine, bro, and uh, we made it happen that way, bro. Yeah, that's how. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm 34, so that's how I would find out about. You know, I would try to reach out to my forums and all that, and try to find out like who's. You know, obviously, I know I'm, I'm from New York, so I would, I would know who's locally, who, who's the guys yeah. and all that. But I was like, I need to find out who else is out there. You know, because obviously it's not like how it is today, where it's just you just hit the computer and just are right, 24 seven dot you know rankings or, or on three you find out you know who the top players in every state is like you got right. to really you got to do your research back then to find out who's the who's the guys in in in, the, in Michigan who's the guys in you know in Texas who's the guys in in Florida and I I missed that part I missed that part where I felt like a scientist I had to figure out you know find out this you know try to get magazines from this person who I, I had someone you know from this day oh can you send me whatever you know magazines or newspapers so you, I could oh. find out who's the guy you know because I'm like a hoop head like that like I would try to find out everyone like you know like every try to every magazine and all that so like that part was old to me I missed that part of like trying to find out like who the hoopers were not just in New York City you know now that's real bro that's me and my dogs, we talking about this all the time, just how nostalgic things were at that time, dog. Like, looking back mm -hmm. at the 90s, bro, I was like, damn, dog. The 90s was actually a, a good time to be living, bro. Like, 90s was cool. Like, I feel mm -hmm. like just, just like going to Blockbuster, going to the arcade, like, <laughs> yep. going all that cool shit. Now, you looking back, that shit feels real nostalgic now, dog. And, yeah, um, man. You know, as far as the hoop scene, bro, like, we learned about other players just by actually, you know, being on the circuit. Mm-hmm. And going on, you know, going to um, Bob Givens on the weekend in North Carolina, you know what I'm saying, playing the tournament down there. And then going out to, to Vegas and shoot down to Indiana, shooting, you know what I'm saying? We had to move around, bro. It was a real, you know what I'm saying? You had to be there type mm -hmm. type guys. And, um, and, and quite frankly, I believe that made us a little bit more, um, what's the word? It, you know, uh, it made us more connected in a certain sense. We actually appreciated being able to see some other, you know, top players. You know what I'm saying? I saw that in person. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's nothing, you know, obviously we love the internet, man. I love YouTube, bro. Like, I'm a YouTube yeah. fan, bro. But, you know what I'm saying? It's nothing like that real personal experience when you had to really be creative and dig deep. You know what I'm saying? Like, you had to really wake up in the morning and see your, your name in the newspaper, bro, and see that. That meant audience. something. That meant something. What? Bro, that meant everything, dog. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, damn, I had 28 points last night. I thought I had 24, but, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? You about you know two or three extra rebounds, about four or five assists. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I, I do miss the nostalgia of all of that stuff, dog. And, um, and, and and a lot of the things that I'm doing now, as far as you know, my creative side, I'm always trying to like capture that nostalgia, that nostalgic moment out of out of uh, my experiences that I've had here in this world, bro. Yeah, um, looking back, man, I feel like that's a part of it, dog. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a song called AAU. And it's, uh, it's me and my guy. We sitting on the bench. It's this tournament. We play LeBron. And uh, we just sitting on the bench. You know what I'm saying? And I got a song playing. But it's like so. It just brings back memories, man, during a time where, you know, life was different. Let's just call it that. Yeah, for sure. So did you play against LeBron in, in the in the circuit? Because you, you, you're you like, oh, you're O2, right? You're the O2 class, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, ABC camp. ABC yeah. Y'all, I remember uh, ABC camp. Uh, that, was, that was the camp where, like, legends were made. Like, Big time. Yeah. So how was that like going against? Because this, I can imagine if him coming out now with those social media, like like back then, like you, it was crazy. Like you, like everybody knew was hearing about LeBron James, and he kind of like was like the first like phenom that we were hearing about. Everyone was hearing about him and all that. So how did you when you went against him? Did you feel that around him when you played against him like that? Like wow, uh, like, this dude is different. You know? Oh uh, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Uh, he was. Nah, we all knew he was special. It was one of those things. Me and him got cool, though. Me and him got kind of cool. Uh, I went on to Michigan. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Damn. Michigan ooh, was playing ooh, Ohio ooh, State. Ooh, ooh. You, don't want, you don't want them to hear that, <laughs> that you went to Michigan. Yeah, yeah I went on to, it was a Michigan and Ohio State football game. You know, so I went down there for a recruiting visit to Ohio State. You know, he was there. You know, we, me and him got, kind of got cool. He was just kicking it, chopping it up. Mm -hmm. I think I was 16. He was 15. And uh, he was at the game. It was funny, bro. 
speaking of nostalgia, you know, he was selling the Motorola, Motorola to your two way pages. <laughs> You know, two-way pages, bro. High school, dog. Yeah, um, you know, I never forget that, dog. So, um, nah, man. The homie, we was always pretty much down to earth, dog. So I never really got that super, 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 superstar treatment. Gotcha, gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Because he was just a cool dude, bro. You can mm-hmm. tell he's still down to earth. You know what I'm saying? To this day. Yeah, he he was. You know, he he was. I mean, the legend was crazy. He just hearing about him back in the day and all that. So. I can imagine, you know, just being around about it. You said like he's just a cool dude. He's still to this day. You can just feel that that he's just a cool dude and all that, you know, all that. So, mm-hmm. what about the recruiting scene, all right? Because obviously you you only go to Michigan State. So, how was the recruiting scene for you? Were, were you getting flooded with with uh with letters and all that and schools coming at you, or was it always Michigan State? Nah, 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 nah. Michigan State was definitely um. I'm not gonna say they came on late, but it was you know they was peeping around a little bit up. I wanted to go to Ohio State early on. That was the school I really wanted to go to early. But, um, you know, yeah, I definitely got a shit ton of letters, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like like I said, going back to watching Hoop Dreams, bro, mm-hmm. and seeing, you know, I'm like, oh, shit, I want that to happen for me. So yeah. when I first got my – I got my first letter from Harding University, dog. <laughs> like Harding? Yeah, Harding, bro. And I was, I, was, <laughs> I was actually happy about it. I'm like, this is my first letter. I was a sophomore. Okay. And I got my next letter from Kansas State. And then, you know, I started okay. getting letters from Kansas State. Start getting a letter from like Iowa State, but these were like the the, the mock letters. Like they sent mm-hmm. to anybody that was kind of like, yeah, okay. I know, like okay. I'm just like, man, they sent that to the nigga down the street. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, you catch on quick, and then you start getting the handwritten letters, mm-hmm. and then you start taking visits and stuff like that. But you know, my, you know, my recruiting process was was cool. It was strenuous. Um, uh, it, I guess it was one of those things where I was excited about it in the beginning. And then towards the end, I was like, no, man. I, it was more draining than anything else because I started seeing how things were actually handled. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, and just like, damn, dog, this yeah. is really a business. You it know really what I'm saying? Is, it really it's is. Like, I had to figure that out. It wasn't a lot of people at that time, kind of just letting me know that All right, my nigga, you, you, you actually a commodity now. Like, I'm mm-hmm. still here. I'm still intentional in terms of just like, yo, fun and and um, you see that like, there's a lot of people, you know, with their hands in trying to, you know, benefit from wherever I go to school, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? That could take a, you know, take you to a, through a different twist as a uh, young hooper, you know what I'm saying? And I feel like for me, man, I went through that process, but you know, I'm glad I chose Michigan State. I actually was about to go to Missouri, changed my mind. My mom wanted me to go to Michigan State, and that's the main reason why I went to Michigan State, my mom wanted me to. And I've, I've talked to a lot of, like, you know, former NBA players and, and former, you know, D1, you know, kids, and they talk about how strenuous that recruiting because that that's an important decision in your life. That's probably maybe for a lot of people, that's your first big decision in your life is picking where you're gonna go to school to. So they talk, you know, talking about like mentioning that, like the strength, the stress that puts on you and all that, you know. But what was it for you that said, okay, Michigan State is it? And how long did it did you need to did it take days? Did it take, you know, a, a night's sleep before you felt comfortable with that decision? Because obviously, like I said, that's a big, massive decision, you know, for you. Uh, no, nah, I didn't. Honestly, I committed to Missouri, bro. And I actually decommitted. My mom, I ain't gonna lie, man. My mom was like, nah. Uh, <coughs> she, she was very stern about it, you know. And my mom wasn't really that strict on me, bro. But, you know, in that moment, she definitely was like, nah, I'm not feeling Missouri. And, um, gonna find out she was right about it because Missouri ended up getting, into, you know, some, some issues and stuff, you know, maybe mm-hmm. a year after that. So, she was right, you know what I'm saying? But I, I wanted to go to Missouri. I wanted to play for Quinn Snyder, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, right. Quinn Snyder was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm glad I made my, my decision, bro. But it, it was definitely, you know, my mom's who, who persuaded me. And, and did you talk to Coach Izzo? You know, it was did he come to the crib, you know, all that? And, you know, it, was he, how persuasive was he, you know, in his, in, his, uh, in his speech? He was more persuasive to my mom. You know what I'm saying? You know, Magic that's you got to get to. That's how you got to get. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that's exactly what happened. You know what I'm saying? He was more. Magic Johnson was more persuasive at times too. So, you know, they, they sell you all of the, they, the, the everything. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, everything that a parent want to hear. You know, like I said, it's a sales pitch. It is a business. And, um, you know, and that's what it became at that point. You know? So, you're on campus and all that. You know, were you? 
you know, what was that feeling when you when you finally get on campus and, and you're you're a member of the, of the basketball team and all that? Did you was there jitters and all that, or were you straight like, all right, I'm ready to go. This is you know, I'm nah, hoop and all that. You know, I went out there early, bro. Like I graduated high school, you know, and um, once I graduated high school, I was already at state, bro. Like I, it was over. Like I, like I probably, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But anyway, I was at Michigan State by at least springtime. You know, I was up there early. Mm-hmm. I was actually staying with Kelvin Tober. And the homies in their dorm room, you know what I'm saying, and Chris Hill, you know, so I actually got acclimated pretty early. And then, um, you know, by the time the semester was up, you know, I was like, moved out there for summer for uh, summer school. And then uh, summer school was lit. It was so much fun, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was, it was, it was, ah, we talking about nostalgic, bro. Yeah. <laughs> seeing, the, seeing the chicks, you know what I'm saying? You know, I, that whole summer, bro, I was cutting hair. You know what I'm saying? I was cutting hair, you know what I'm saying? <coughs> Oh, five dollars, you know, per cut, you know what I'm saying? Giving people the peek, peek, peeks, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, just hooping, going to class. That's summer school, man. That summer school is fun. Yeah, the time, but like by the time, uh, you know, the season rolled around, you know, it's the football season, so we're going to the football games. Mm-hmm. We did, we're doing tailgating, you know, we're doing the open runs, all the NBA players coming back, and uh, yeah, it was fun, dog. I had my, I had my, um, um what was the word I'm looking for? Yeah, yeah, it was dope, especially just dorm surfing as a freshman. That was, a, <laughs> you know, you know, seeing yeah. money, money for the first time. You like, oh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But was uh, was there any like trend? Like, was there um? Any transition as far as your game that you had to adjust to, you know, once you got, you know, got to playing and all that, or was it, you know, you got to play your game and all that, you know, was it much? Man, what? I mean, if you know, one, college is a different game and all that. It's a whole yeah, different type uh, of game. I mean, I had to for sure definitely get my body strong. You know what I'm saying? You know, that was the biggest thing for me is just, you know, strengthening my body. But, you know, the way I played was definitely, you know, I had to, you know, cater to Michigan State, you know what I'm saying? And his old style, you know what I'm saying? I was mm-hmm. a, I was a one-on-one player coming out of high school, so it was like I had to really adjust my game into a. Um, I say I, you know I didn't pass the ball, but it's like I was an ISO guy. You know what I'm saying? Hey, exactly. move out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Izzo actually didn't give me that to my junior year, and um, you know, and and honestly, I was probably the first player that I can think of, bro. I don't 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 quote me on this. That Izzo actually let me go up top and let me get my thing off floor flat. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, yeah. It was a big adjustment, but you know, I had to kind of pay my, I had to pay my dues first before I was course, able to go out there and, and do that. But he saw that in me, and he recognized that that was something that we can utilize later on. And um, you know, I definitely took advantage of that. But nonetheless, dog, you know, the speed of the game, and for me, just definitely learning all the plays and the sets. We had so many plays, bro. Like, <laughs> still don't remember them shits. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. Actions but, and early yeah, breaks. I can... and a lot in you know, high school. Yeah, because what you see with a lot of kids, you know, you know, that, you know, they, they got the ball in their hand all the time in high school and the AA scene, you know, AAU scene and all that. And then they go to college. Now it's a big adjustment because now you're playing more of a team game. It's a different style. You're playing a, a slower pace of basketball. And you see a lot, even like some of the top kids, like they struggle with that. And that's a real yeah. thing. That's a yeah. real thing you see. And then, you know, where it's like, whoa, I'm the guy and everywhere I've been in, in high school. No matter where I'm, I'm the guy. Now I'm in college. Now I'm just one of the guys. It don't matter if that was the number one dude in this state or I'm the number one player in the country and all that. I got to play within this system or else yeah. it, it ain't going to work. And we see a lot of kids struggle with that. Why Why do you think so many kids struggle with that? Especially if I see a lot nowadays, like I said, with the evolution of social media, everyone thinks they're the dude and all that. They go to college and we're seeing a lot of kids struggle, you know, um, off the jump because they can't adjust to now they got to be you know facilitate they got to play they got to be in one spot now you know where they're used to just having the rock in their hand at all times yeah i feel like that that has a lot to do with the coaching staff sitting these kids down and really talking talking to them about um expressing how important it is to you know check your ego mm-hmm. you know your ego has to be checked you know what i'm saying and and that's the process as well i feel like we go through our whole entire lives you know, doing ego checks. So it's like when you're a young guy coming out of high school, you're not necessarily getting the same looks that you did in high school, unless you're coming in as like a Carmelo or like a, a Durant. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You probably have four or five 
five star guys on your team. So it's like it, it really boils down to you know you know getting your guys to buy in mm-hmm. on the importance of playing your role. You can still go get your rocks off, but but you, you low key kind of gotta you know you gotta do it differently now. So it's like you, you know like you said you gotta you gotta buy in, bro, and, and, and teach them how to be selfless, and it's ultimately gonna make them better players. And uh, you know a lot of guys figure it out, and some don't. You know some guys are just just bullheaded, bro, and they never mm-hmm. get to that point where they can um, see past themselves. And then what happens? They end up transferring all over the place. Thank God we have the portal system now, you know what I'm saying, where guys mm-hmm. don't have to sit out. But it was a point in time where guys would, would transfer, sit out for a year, yeah. lose a year, come back. You know, they're not the same. And so it, it's it's a lot that goes with that, you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, it's, a, it's important that young guys realize that, hey, listen, hey, you still go win, but now it's and – it, and they got to learn that because you want to go to the NBA, you know, Nine times out of ten, you're not going to be the go-to guy in the NBA. So it's like mm-hmm. it's a good time to really learn how to mess your game and play with others and, you know, become, you know, uh, that type of team player. And, and quite frankly, it's up to the colleges too. You got to know that before a kid get there. You're like, hey, if this kid isn't necessarily – can I see him fitting into my, my system? Sometimes, you know, these college these colleges want to go for the, the, the top players, but, you know, can they fit you? Like, are they coachable? You know, but you know, nowadays with social media and everything, you know, what I'm saying, I feel like they should have a lot more to go off of in terms of um, bringing these guys in, right? Yeah, and there's a you know, playing in the one and done era and all that because it's like even when you're in college, most at that point, you know, you got a few guys who could you come out, you know, after one year, but it was still, you know, you got your three, four year players and all that. You know, not everybody wants to just go right to the league after the one year, and like some guys just aren't ready, it may take two three, four years. Like you were a four year player, right? Was yeah. that always the goal? Was the goal always to, to be a, you know, stay four years or did you like, like I think I could get in the league in two or, or I can, I, yeah, I, yeah. I definitely wanted to uh, freshman year. Not, not so much, but definitely sophomore year. You know, I was feeling like, you know, I wanted to be one of those two and done guys, but mm-hmm. you know, I had some injuries early on. And, um, some, some, actually some major injuries my first two years, first year I had a stress fracture in my left foot, you know what I'm saying? So that pretty much put me out. Um, Majority of the preseason, I came back for the last preseason against Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Played pretty good. Um, no, nah, actually, I came back two or three games before. You know, I played against Oklahoma, did my thing. But um, sophomore year, you know, I struggled a bit just because I had a, a, a ankle fracture and I was playing with a double hernia, sports hernia. So that pretty Ooh. much slowed things down for me. Oh man, that's, that's cool. rough. It was that's brutal. Rough. I played with it, and you know, they they still didn't realize that I was as hurt as I said I was. They were just kind of like, "Oh, you gassing." And then, you know, I got the MRI. They was like, "Oh, this nigga got two holes in the stomach." So I, <coughs> that's you know, crazy. You know, so I did surgery going into my junior year, and that's when I had my breakout year. But um, I actually was was I was coming out my junior year after I did that nice little run against mm-hmm. the uh, you know in the NCAA tournament. You know, I was yeah, y'all had a good year, right? Y'all beat Duke, right? Y'all beat Duke in that year. Duke and Kentucky in the same. Duke weekend. and Kentucky, yeah, yeah, yeah. We played North Carolina, ran up against those guys, and it was tough. But you know what I mean? They had like seven, eight pros, first round picks. That's a that's a national championship, uh, uh, Carolina team, right? With Felton and and all them boys, right? Uh, McCants, Sean yeah, Bay, yeah, McCants, um, yeah. And I led that game in scoring. I had like twenty five. Like, yeah, I had twenty five on all these dudes. I'm out of here, bro. <laughs> I'm running back out in the tunnel after the game. I'm like, I'm dying. It's, it's over. I'm, I'm a goner. <laughs> <laughs> were you yeah. getting like? The, were you getting? You know, feelers like, oh, you're gonna, you, you're probably, you come out your junior year, you'll probably be, you know, top 50 lottery pick or your top 25 at least. Were you getting that that made you feel like, okay, I think I could come out after my junior year? I was getting, man, listen, bro, I was getting anywhere between like 20 and, and late. So it's like, honestly, bro, I probably would have went the same if I went out my two year, bro. If I mm-hmm. want to be completely honest, I probably would have went the same around, you know, in the 20s. But nonetheless, like I came back for the senior year and, and did some legendary stuff as well. But I still think I would have been drafted at the same at the same time. That's just my opinion. You know, what mm-hmm. saying? based on it's based off of my projections. It was all mm-hmm. saying nineteen to twenty eight. Shit, I got drafted twenty eight my senior year. So I was like, yeah. So so how was that process? All right, four years. You have a you know legendary career in Michigan State and all that. You know now you're getting ready for the draft. And how how was how was the draft process for you and all that? Because it's you know, obviously, there's a lot. You got the combine and all that, and then, and, and, you know, you're getting questions and all that. So, how was that process for you before you, you know, getting ready for the draft that year? 
Um, I feel like I, I low key have some of somewhat of a leg up just because you know we had a guy named Jim Boylan on our staff. You know, you know Jim Boylan, he goes yeah. with the Bulls, so he was actually on our staff. So he actually prepped me for a lot. You know what I'm saying? He was putting me through a lot of NBA workouts and stuff like that. So I knew what to expect going in. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly, I um dropped the ball because maybe I should have chose a different agent because I believe that I wasn't advised properly in terms gotcha. of how many workouts I was doing. Like, I did, I, I broke the record, bro, for, for NBA workouts, dog. Like, what are you doing, like 30? You, you, you did every team? Man, damn near. I got, I did every team except the team I got drafted by, bro. <laughs> Including Utah twice, Houston twice, Cleveland twice. And here's what happened, bro. I, you know, I did so many workouts, you know, and uh, my agent was like, oh, they want to see you. this person. Like, my value dropped just because I was going everywhere, bro. And, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? I'm doing a workout in Philly. Then I'm turning around doing a workout in the morning in Phoenix. That's not, I'm not going to be as, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. Yeah. Works, bro. It's like, it is what it yeah, is, bro. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, like, I'm flying halfway. Did, did you say, did you, did you say anything? Did you, because you, you know, obviously you're young and all that. So you're probably not mm-hmm. just, you're just doing whatever. But like, was there any, at any point you were like, this doesn't feel right at all. Bro, um, yeah. But you know what I mean? You want to listen to your agent. you like, oh, this team yeah, wants to see exactly. You want to see me, but in, but in my back of my mind, I'm like, damn, I played four years at a big college. I saw me two, three times a week. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You I got that feeling. Yeah. No, but you know, I was going in and doing all these well, these workouts, dog, and, and eventually on a shit, 19th workout, like eventually the quality is going to drop, dog. Exactly. You know yeah, so, yeah. And I'm not saying I had trash workouts, but it gets around. You know what I'm saying? That, okay, he didn't have a good. Yeah, he was okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And then eventually, certain things. You know, and there's a lot of moving pieces to why you know. You know, I feel like I, I feel like I might have dropped in the draft, but mm-hmm. here's the deal, bro. I feel like that was a life lesson. You know what I'm saying? You know, I did a lot. You know what I'm saying? But it's it showing me now. Like, okay, I mean, I guess there's a certain level. Of less is more. Um, yeah. I probably could have sure. did 10, 12 workouts and, and probably put myself in a better position. You know what I'm saying? But I did way too many workouts, and you know, my my agent was I won't say he fair. He was fairly new at that time, but he he just wanted to. I guess he felt like. He was doing his job by putting me in front of different teams. Yeah. I'm not mad at that, but ultimately, I believe it hurt my draft status. But as far mm-hmm. as an experience, I wouldn't change it. Into, yeah, I changed that shit. But it's like, <laughs> but, <laughs> but but the things that I experienced, <laughs> yeah. You know, but the things I experienced, exactly. You know, yeah. It was dope. I had some fun. You know what I mean? You know, just probably stuff. But, but know, yeah, like. Because, like you said, you went late first and all that. So to do that many workouts, because usually you probably do around wherever you, you feel like you're going in that range, you probably do whatever what teams are around that. You probably do that. So, But like you said, you're young and all that. You just And you said you have a young agent, too. So, like, he's just trying to get you as many workouts as possible. So every team, you know, so you're not, you know, every team could see you and all that. So, you know, you could see, you know, you could see now, like, ah, oh, man, I wish I would have done that. But like you said, you had so many experiences that now you can, you know, it made you appreciate things and all that, but draft day happens and all that. What's, what's the nerves of where, where, where are you at? You know, did you have a party? Were you at the draft or like, what, what's the scene for you? I was definitely at the draft because once again, I was projected to go anywhere late, late lottery to mid to mid first round. You know what I'm saying? I, I didn't want, you know what? Shit. I was actually projected 28th. I, I watched the mock draft. I looked at the mock mm-hmm. draft on the day before in the hotel. They already had me going to Dallas at 28. I'm like, right. I'm going to, I'm at least going 20 to, to New York because Isaiah Thomas told me that he was going to pick me at 20. Been New York. Was that your first time in New York? You know, besides like playing in, in tournaments and all that, was that your first time in New York? That you got to enjoy because I know yeah. you, you playing ball, but you probably had some games at the garden and all that, but you didn't get to like really enjoy. But this is the first yeah. time you had to yeah. see yeah. New York. And then like, I could actually be a Nick too. Like, yeah, bro. I'm telling you, Zeke was like, all right, well, listen. Because I had my workout. I think Quincy Doobie was in it. Um, Marty Collins. I oh, roasted them. They took, too. They I took was, Marty Collins, too. Man, I was frying. I fried that workout. <laughs> I'm like, and, this is and that, that's another thing I want to ask you, too, is like, you seeing guys go ahead of you, you're like, I cooked him. I cooked him. Bro. Like, I'm better than him. I, why, did, why are they seeing in him? You know, that, that must have went through your mind, too, during the draft. Yeah, that that shit. That's <laughs> life, ain't it? Like, <laughs> that's life at this point. Like, uh, facts, like bro. really? Facts. I like that. 
really? All right. Yeah. So uh so Isaiah Thomas was like, listen, bro. He's like, man, look, hey, you still here at 20. You know you want 21. You won't go. I'm like, all right, bet. Worst case scenario, I play with Zeke, childhood hero. Mm-hmm. One of the people that I looked up to. I told him that I'm like, yo, bro, I, I, I admired you, man. You don't want to show me what it's like to have heart. You know what I'm saying? I watched you play on one wheel, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's get it, bro. Like, yeah. all right, cool. I thought I was going to at least go to like maybe Philly or Utah. I mean, I think I did a workout in Philly, bro. I broke, I broke like a three point record. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Utah, I'm down here in Utah working out for these mugs. Can't even breathe, but I'm still cooking. That altitude was frying me, bro. Oh, I can imagine. Was, uh, I'm like, I, I don't know if I want to hoop here. But, uh. <laughs> I, remember, I remember talking to uh, uh, Ronnie Brewer about that, you know, playing in Utah. And it's like, that was, that's it's different. It's different. Ronnie, that's my guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm happy, I'm happy he went. Um, yeah, I was always happy for him. But um, yeah, dog, so I thought I was going to at least. Once they called Renardo Balkman, I was like, what? Because they had two picks that draft. They had two. They had they took Ronaldo and then they wanted to took him Marty. So it would have made sense to take Ronaldo. Let's say they, they still take Ronaldo first, but taking you know a guy like you, who got the you know four-year player and all that, that makes sense. Take a guard and all that. So, you know, I'm sure when you heard Marty Collins, you know, that was like, uh, was that the pick after? Was was the pick after you went with Dallas or was the before the Knicks? Marty, Marty went after me. After okay, so yeah, yeah, Marty Collins. So uh, yeah, it was cool. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the the crowd was was very supportive after I got drafted, bro. Broke down crying. You know what I'm saying? The nerves was through the roof. Mm-hmm. Over, I had a cup of juice. I was that shit was empty for like two hours. I'm over. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't had nothing in. I'm just over. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Waiting on them to call my name. <laughs> then finally, like security guard was right next to me. He was like, "Oh shit, for real." <laughs> I just broke down crying, dog. That's a whole down. It's a beautiful yeah, moment, though. Hard. It's a beautiful moment. Man, it was lit. Yeah. So you go up, you, you meet the commissioner and all that. Like that's that's like a dream, right? That that's probably the dream you thought about when you was a young and and all that, you know, all that hard work and all that. And like everybody dreams for that moment, like to to shake the commissioner's hand and all that. And and you're one of the few people who, who got that up who had got that opportunity. To, to do that uh, that's special you could you, that's that's you're never going to forget that no matter you know no matter how you, the nba career went all that you're gonna always have that moment which is then that's dope definitely dog yeah i saw that early on bro that was one of the reasons why i wanted to go to NBA for that moment i saw stefan marbury get drafted we cried mm-hmm. dog. i was like damn bro like whatever you, you're crying because you're happy we from mm-hmm. the city bro we, we only cry because we got our, our mama beat our ass or something so it's like to watch somebody cry from joy was a I'm like, I want to experience that, man. I cried when he was in seventh. I was in seventh grade. I was like, this nigga got drafted. I started crying. I felt that, bro. Mm-hmm. I'm, like, oh. I'm like, okay. All right, here we go. You know what I'm saying? I went outside, worked on my game right after that, dog. And, um, it happened for me, and, you know, I, I was able to experience that feeling. So, is That's it. dope. That's dope. That's dope. You got to experience that. But what was that? What was that welcome to the NBA moment, though? What was that moment? You're like, oh, this is different. <laughs> You know, whether it's going against uh, someone in practice or just, you know, a moment, you know, what was that? Ah, man, I'm going to be real, bro. That that wasn't it, man. Like, no? like I, I really ain't. No. It was being inactive for four or five games. That's. <laughs> in the beginning that, yeah. of the season, like the first four or five games, I'm, I'm in the suit. Like, mm-hmm. nah, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that, that was my welcome to the NBA moment right there. It wasn't yeah. the on the court. Like, I held my own on the court. You know what I'm saying, yeah. especially in practice and workouts and open gym, like that was I mm-hmm. my own. Everybody know that, but it was definitely that that right there. Like it, it was something I wasn't meant to prepare for. Nobody prepared me for it, and it was just something that I had to experience. Dog, just, just well, you're inactive. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> yeah, we're man. sport, we're a sport coach to the game, son. I'm like, what? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And that's when they just implemented the the you know the dress right. It was around that time like they yeah, started dress, the dress, dress code. code. So so you you know you're yeah, a rookie, you gotta wear a suit every you know, and you're not playing and all that. That's like a double like wow, like and uh, I'm not sure that's another like you said like you went from playing all this time in Michigan State. And now you go to the league and it's like all right, are you ready? And then boom, you hit with all them inactives and all that and all that. And that was a good team too. You were on you were on a, a really good team. So, yeah, like, so imagine the type of pressure you know Avery Johnson had on him, right? He, you know, he just went to the finals the year before that. 
I just don't feel like I was at the, you know, I, I was, uh, you know, I'll keep it a buck. I wasn't necessarily a priority for him in order okay. to implement me in in that way. You know what I'm saying? Like, I've made plenty of mistakes the reasons why I didn't hoop and, you know, get those opportunities mm-hmm. early on. But nonetheless, it was like, oh, we got to get back to the finals. Anything less was a, a um, underachievement just because of the year they had before. So mm-hmm. I came in on the veteran team, bro. It was like, you know, and they, you know, like I said, dog, they already had their heart set on getting back to it. And, um, yeah, and, and that's and that's tough for a, a young young player coming into a team that's so veteran, you know, led and all that. Because we, we think, you know, as fans or whatever, you're like, oh, he's going into a great situation because he's going to go to a team that has a bunch of vets and all that. But it, it's not always the case, you know, because we, we see it a, a lot today, like like with the Warriors were like Wiseman. Other, we thought that was a perfect situation, but he was probably better off going to, you know, a, a, you know, maybe a worse team and playing more and, on, and you know, getting on the court where yeah. the pressure, the you know, they want to win now. You know, like you said, you go right. into a team that just was, you know, a few games away from winning a championship, right? They were up 2-0 in that series against Miami. Yeah. And all that. So, like, they championship mode. They're not, they're not, like you said, they weren't invested in the youngins because, you know, it's like, you know, we got to win a championship. You know, we got Dirk in his prime and all that. We get to we we don't really care what, about Maurice's progress and all that. We're not that's not our focus. Focus is just getting back to the championship and all that. So like yeah. for you, you you know that you know it sounds good to go to Dallas. Oh, I'm going to a championship team, but it's like well, right. well actually, you know, I'm hit like you said DMPs and all that. Where if I'm going to you know New York, I'm playing. You're you playing know, in I'm New York. Cool. You know, and so and- like. It's crazy. I feel like, you know, things would have went differently if that was the case. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm not one of those people who, like, I wish to, like, I'm super happy I went to Dallas because Dallas mm-hmm. became a second home for me out there in mm-hmm. America. My mom still lived down there. The people down there treated me great. You know, Mark Cuban was an amazing owner. You yeah. know, I met some great friends, Josh Howard, those guys, you know, Sagana Chop, Pops, Mr. Bonsu, um, you know, playing with Dirk, you know, you know, having some shining moments as well. Like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm not gonna say I just didn't get my rocks off. I had some really good moments with the Dallas Mavericks. Um, I have highlights to this day that I use that help me maneuver this earth. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, things worked out the way they did. And I understand why they worked out the way they did just because mm-hmm. of the circumstances. Um, me being a rookie, you know, making a bonehead decisions off the court, you know what I'm saying? And, and um, you know, and then when you get to a point where you're not playing as much, you're like, all right, fuck it, I'm a party. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to do a lot of partying. And, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't do a great job at all times of keeping myself prepared. You know what I'm saying? And I have to take yeah, ownership yeah. of that. You know what I'm saying? So whenever I did get my opportunities, you know, um, you know, like I wasn't consistent. You did what I'm saying? I had days where I had, you know, play eight minutes and get nine points. I had days when I played six minutes and I had two points. And then I had times mm-hmm. where I played 15 minutes, you know, I might not do as well. And then, you know, I have stretches. It was just never a, a, a consistent thing, you know. But yeah. like I said, I had great moments and I had some, you know, some um, not so good moments. But a lot of those things happened just because of, you know, um, maybe, you know, not really having a real rhythm, not having really a a, a, a large margin for error. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the, yeah, my yeah. margin for error was very small at a, as a rookie. And, mm-hmm. you know, as we saw and, and during that year, or just now, you know what I'm saying, guys who have who can make enough, you know, make mistakes and play through their mistakes, you know, eventually they figure it out. And, mm-hmm. and frankly, I didn't, we didn't have time for that. You know what I'm saying? Exactly, so, especially on that team and all that. Yeah, I'm down in the D-League now, you know what I'm saying, down here <laughs> playing, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> On Wendy's instead of motherfucking. <laughs> but, I went back, I went back to the hood real quick. But the, D league, the D League, the Dog League. Yeah, the D League. It was, and that wasn't like the G League is now, right? It definitely was not as glamorous as it was, you know, as it is now. <laughs> I remember getting on the cheese bus one time to go to a game. Oh, oh, they did you dirty like that. Oh, that's how bad. I've heard, I've heard horror stories from people. Yeah, I didn't know. Up. I didn't know it was that bad. Where they got you on the, you know, the cheese buses and all that. that yeah, that's- man, we in the um the, the rooster inn, you know. <laughs> you know, <coughs> that's crazy. <laughs> no, nah, it was fun. I had fun. I had man. <laughs> I'm gonna make the best out of any situation, dog. So exactly. Exactly. I did exactly. my thing, man. It was cool. That's cool. But but you on that Dallas team that you know. One of the sixty-seven games that year, y'all was balling. Dirk wins MVP. But then you go against, you know, the the at Warriors team and all that. So, 
you know, and obviously they they lose and what well, they lost in six and all that. Baron Davis with you know bodying Kurilenko and all that. That's that's oh. like a, a moment that lives forever and all that and all. That. But you know what was that experience like? You know because like I said, they just went to the finals and all that. And now they you know they almost won seventy games. I mean they they do incredible things and then it ends in the first round. Like I remember like that I think they were still doing where they when you win the MVP you you get a hand that you know they show you in like a like game one or whatever and crowd and all that and Dirk didn't even get that moment because he then lost and all so just talk to me about that experience of seeing that in you know, that whole season play out because like Dirk went through a lot like people were like the way we talk about Dirk now, they weren't talking about Dirk back then. They were talking him like he's, you know, he's the next Charles Barkley and Carl Malone and all the guys, you know, great players who, you know, who never won a championship and all that. Yeah, he was. Um, I think uh, for one, you know, uh, we played against Golden State. You know, what I'm saying a few few games before the playoffs, and I actually started and I had my career high, 20 points against them. You know, I did. I got my, you know, I got my work in against them. That was in Golden State. So watching that series, I'm like, oh man, my confidence up, dog. Mm-hmm. This is the type of shit that he's having. You know what I'm saying? Like, I started against Golden State, right? Came out 20 piece. Yeah. First first starting game. I was like, mm-hmm. look, man. Started. Yeah. Yep. Give me, I got a dub. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Next game, inactive. <sighs> Gets the bum ass Seattle Supersonics, bro. <laughs> I'm like, man, y'all, y'all couldn't let me catch a rhythm. Mm hmm. Damn, I just had a 20 P. Let me get another. Uh, yeah, let me yeah, see yeah. How I can do this again and see what happens. Ah, man. Hold that suit. Man. All right. So we playing Gold State in, in the playoff the whole time. I was like, yo, this is my type of mm-hmm. they physical. They playing street ball. They was, they was playing like real niggas. So I'm like, all right. Yeah. If I get an opportunity, first of all, Matt Burns doing the most shooting threes, looking back at the bench. I'm like, all right. Let me get in the game. So. I think one guy, I don't know if it was game three again, whatever. We got in, got like a couple free throws, got a couple buckets. Matt Burns came down. Boom! Boom! Knocked him all the way into the crowd. Bang! Flagrant. They called it a flagrant on me. You know what I'm saying? But I told him, I'm like, yo, I'm going to knock your ass out as soon as I get in the game, bro. Right <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing too much. You're doing all of this. Mm-hmm. I gave him one. Bang! We was already losing, so I wasn't tripping. He did, um, you know, tech. Bang! I come back down. Bing! Boom! Flagrant on me. I'm like, all right, that's what it is. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it, I was like, all right, I like this. So it's like, we end up losing the series. But the very last game, I think I had like 10 points in like eight minutes. I'll score Dirk. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'll score <laughs> Dirk. You know, something like that. I should have been playing the kid, bro. Yeah, man. So a lot of that stuff end up playing on your mind, bro. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to the NBA stuff, there's a lot of politics that, go into it, that goes into it. But mind you, man, I was already, man. Bro, I'm gonna be real. Mentally, I was already kind of in into other things, bro. Mm-hmm. Yeah, music and stuff like that. So <clears throat> I wasn't necessarily um married to the fact of playing Indian basketball for 20 years. I just wasn't really feeling the politics. Yeah, I, I could see how that, you know, that could get a player down. You know, like you said, you have a game where you drop 20 and then you get inactive the next game. Like that messes with your psyche. Like, yo, like what? I just had 20. Like, what do you no talk? Why am I like, like? They don't even talk to you about it. Like, you know, we're doing this because we want to make sure that we prepare for the playoffs. You kind of got to guess, like, damn, like, what's up? You know what I'm saying? Like, I just had 20. Well, you just, you know, it wasn't really psychologically um, helping me at that time on the reasons why. And they don't feel like, they don't feel like they felt like they needed to. You know what I'm saying? Like, you a grown man, so it's like that's the difference between college and the pros, bro. Like, you kind of got to figure stuff out on the fly. And, um, and pray you have some solid mentors, you know. Yeah, you know, I had some mentors. Don't get me wrong. You know Sack house, Josh House, those guys were amazing. But once again, dog, you know, you know, they, they didn't feel like they needed to, you know, hold my hand through it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to figure it out. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's like I said, that's a team that's that's trying to win a chip and all that. So they ain't worried about you know the youngins and all that. So you know, you could definitely understand that seeing it from from outside. You they rock with us, no. They rock with us. They just, they just had a mission, bro. Like Stack, yeah. I gotta say that they ain't rock with me. Stack was my guy. Stack was always pulling for me, bro. Josh That's Howard good. was pulling for me. Um, players were definitely pulling for me in many ways. Even um, Dale Harris pulled for me big time. Like shout out to Dale Harris. Dale Harris was, was even when when I left, he was just really kind of like really upset that you know Avery didn't, um, didn't give me more chances in terms of this. 
but once again, I'm not blaming every now. You know, I, mean, it's just, it's, I got love for all those guys. You know, so I'm not yeah. mad. But I definitely remember Dale Harris and Sam Vincent always pulling for me, and Donnie yeah. and Donnie Donnie Nelson was pulling for me. That's good though. At least you had that support from those guys and all that, and you knew that too. So that's dope. That's dope to have the support and all that. You know, like I said, they were on a mission and all that, try to win, you know, a championship and all that. And all, but how would you, you know, you know, you had a, you know, a few years in the league and all that. How would you have? How would you describe your NBA career if you had to? I would describe my NBA career as uh, I'm gonna play four years and all five years professionally. I would describe it as. Um, Well, for me, I, I feel like I have it was underachieving for sure. It was definitely underachieving. Um, but it was a blessing, you know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, I still played four years, you know what I'm saying? You still played in the league though. Like, I, yeah. I know you, you might think it's a disappointment and all that. I'm sure you, you know, but you still got to play in the league though. And like you said, you had you a first round pick, like, you know, that, that's yeah. still an, a, 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 a hell of an achievement that many people would die for, you know? Yeah, I, I like to look at things from. from Many perspectives. One, I like to say, like, okay, for one, it is a blessing that I made to the NBA, played four years, got my pension. Two, I didn't have the type of career that I would like to have had, you know what I'm saying, course, growing up. But, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of things that played into – a lot of things mm -hmm. played a part into why I just wasn't – you know, my last year with the Minnesota Timberwolves, you know, I was actually averaging the most points. You know, I was doing – you know, I was actually – you know, doing really well, you know, but you know, I actually got injured during the preseason year, preseason season, during that preseason, I'm sorry, and uh, I ended up having to make the team. And uh, I was on course to really, you know, do some wonderful things, but I was low-key one foot out just because I feel like I wanted to do more in life. I really wanted mm -hmm. to experience more. Uh, I, I told myself, I'm like, man, I'm going to at least get my pension, and then what happens mm -hmm. from here? And then when the Minnesota when Timberwolves uh, released me, I felt like, oh, shit, this is it. I was mm -hmm. good on being done, bro. I swear to, I swear on life, bro. To this day, I'm happy about my decision and my choice. You know, it was it's had its ups and its downs, but nonetheless, I'm happy with the decision I made because I, my goal was to make it to the NBA and leave in the NBA. I didn't want to be a journeyman, bro. And and I could have been that. Yeah. I could have been the guy who was found his way, stuck it out. I know I could have, but it, it just I just didn't have the desire to be that. You know what I'm saying? I was mm -hmm. at that point, I was much more in tune with who I was and what I was dealing with and, and what I wanted to discover outside of basketball, bro. Yeah. Like I was ready to explore life. I was ready to have my time. I was ready to see what life was like. Period. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I was able to discover those things in this last what it's been shit. 2023. Damn near 12 years. Oh man, I retired in 2011. Damn. Yeah, almost well, 12 years. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems like those years flew by, but the things that I've learned on this journey, it, it had to happen that way, bro. And, yeah. Uh, I'm grateful for it. But um, like I said, I had some great moments in the NBA, dog. Uh, I enjoyed the travel. I enjoyed the, the perks of being an NBA basketball player. Had plenty of dope women. Had plenty of dope, you know what I'm saying, experiences, travels. It was amazing, dog, overall. But nonetheless, man, I feel like my journey was calling for something a lot you know, a lot more greater for myself, you know what I'm saying? No, and that's good because a lot of a lot of players find, you know, struggle with that, with leaving the league, right? That's a big thing. You see a lot of players struggle or don't know what else to do because it's been ball, ball, ball for 20 plus years. And then it's like, it's not there no more. It's like, whoa, like, I Bro. don't really have any other skills. Like, I'm not good at anything else. Like, all I know is ball and all that. So for you to realize that, like, all right, I know I don't want to be that journeyman. I could be that. I could, you know, play for this team this year and the next day, but that's not what I want to do and all that. So that's kudos to you for understanding that and be like, you know what? I'm it's time to, you know, let's figure out this next phase and all that. Cause like I said, a lot of dudes struggle with that. They they don't know how to figure out life without basketball. Let me piggyback off that, bro. And and I'm not, and I'm a firm believer of following a certain path and a purpose and moving in certain directions, bro. And everything happens for a reason. And like I said, man, I was always interested in so many different things in my life, bro. And I just felt like I had to get out and experience it. And I know for a fact that it was meant for me to do that because, you mm -hmm. know, once the NBA launched this transition programs in like 2014, I was the one going out to all these different teams and teaching guys how to make these transitions. And, mm -hmm. and 
pretty much um, mentoring guys, even to this day, bro, mentoring guys on how to transition out of sports and how to live life outside of basketball. That's dope. That's dope because they, they need a lot of people need that. That's dope that they do. Bro, that. It's, it's hard, dog. It, it's really hard to learn how to live a regular life when you just spent the last such such years being under somebody else's program, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And not necessarily having to worry or deal, deal with the things of the day to day things in life. So it's like, you know, I've been able to help a lot of guys make that transition. And, um, you know, even when I was still in the NBA, bro, my last season, bro, I was at the rookie transition camp on the panel speaking to guys about having different passions, taking advantage of being in the NBA and, and networking while people still like you and not necessarily waiting until you two or three years out the league when exactly. you finally yeah. the way you drop and nobody mm -hmm. cares. About you. I tell guys all the time, like, listen, bro, you're in a position now where if you can make these relationships and, and create these relationships now, you know, tap into something that you're passionate about now, you can actually have a, a, a pretty solid life after basketball because trust me, bro, when you leave this game, dog, and, and they don't see you no more, the phones will stop ringing, bro. Exactly. The emails will stop. The, your value drops, you know what I'm saying, just because you're not necessarily on TV every day. People don't feel like they want to be a part. A, a lot of people want to be a part of who you are just for bragging rights. So it's like if you like ha have some type of dope idea or something like that while you're in the NBA, do that now, you know. Say, don't wait till it's over. So those are the things I stress. I I talk to every NBA team, dog, and um, you know, I, I've been able to help in that way in those regards. So I look at myself as somewhat of a sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There's been many guys who come before me who's who's left the NBA who, who just got lost on the way. I got lost, and it's nothing wrong with being lost unless you're trying to find your way. Mm -hmm. So it's like I look at that as a um, as a way of being able to, and even to this day, bro, I'm always reinventing myself always creating new things i'm always being an example of how you can you know transform yourself you know what i'm saying and teaching people how to transform from one phase in their life to the next and putting myself through the, the strenuous gauntlets of these type of you know encounters and experiences bro so um once again dog if i had to describe my nba career it was definitely something that was a stepping stone bro it was a stepping stone and like i said earlier bro it's helped me move around it's an accolade that nobody can take from me and it's something that I can always look back on, and it's something that's going to always kind of somewhat get me through certain doors. But mm -hmm. nonetheless, man, it's going to be my character and my skills and my ability that keep me there, dog. So I teach people that, and uh, that's how we rock. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing. That's a beautiful way to end the show, too, man. Like and like I said, it, it's been a, it's been a it's been fun to talk to you this last hour, man, Maurice. It's been a oh, pleasure and all that. But you. you know, uh, before we sign off and all that, just you know. What, what are you doing right now? What, what's what's the day in the life of, of, of Maurice Hager right now? What are you doing? You know, tell the people, you know, you got any pride. I know you said you were doing music and all that, projects yeah. and all that. You know, just just tell us a little bit about that. Definitely, bro. Uh, first and foremost, man, I created uh, a detox cleanser, you know, a daily detox cleanser. Tap in with me. It's, it's a free program. It's a free program. Tap in with me on my D, on my DM. I give you the ins and outs and the steps on how to, you know, work that, you know, it's to help you clean up you dig right now is a very important time in life that you know uh cleaning out your system will help you pretty much get through these tough times because there's a mm -hmm. lot going on mentally spiritually emotionally financially yep. so the best thing you can do is handle and take care of the things you can control and you can't control what you put in your body and what you take out of it you know i learned these different things because i got sick sometime you know what i'm saying a while ago and i learned the importance of gut health so i created this joint called baby fat water you know what I'm saying? It's a daily detox cleanser. You know what I'm saying? It's a, something you could take on a daily, you know what I'm saying? To, you know, clean yourself out. All right, that's that. I got the Moegger Show, man, which is pretty much my music content. It's my, you know, my video vlogs. I have a, um, a, I don't want to call it a podcast, but I do live shows over on my YouTube channel. I just started mm -hmm. those last week. I bring guests on, we build, chop it up. Uh, um, you know, I got the new album out, Moegger Show premieres. That's on my band camp. And uh, oh, yeah, and I just created the Moegger Show. Pure, you dig what I'm saying? So it's all dope mm -hmm. ass designs that I created. So we outside, man. We making things happen. We move forward, tap in. Everything is on my Moager channel. You know what I'm saying? You got the Moager Show link, boom, and the Moager Show apparel link. Beat. Follow all of them, and um, you know, chop it up with me, man. We outside. Man. Yep, yeah, cool. yep. So I'll make sure to put all that in the description. Like I said, make sure to follow Maurice and all that on IG and, and support all his you know, his endeavors and all that. But Maurice Hager, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. It, it means a lot, man. Appreciate you, brother. And and I'm, I root, you know, your story is great. 
And I think it's a lesson for a lot of people to learn, not just in the basketball scene, but it's in life too. Like, so uh, I appreciate you, you know, coming in, chopping up with me, you know, uh, for this last hour. And, and like I said, uh, you know, I wish you nothing but success, brother. Man, I appreciate it, dog. And um, yo, keep doing your thing, man. Keep the good energy, man. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's cool, man. I appreciate you reaching out to me, man. No, no, no doubt. No, I appreciate you answering, man. I, I, you know, like sometimes you get left on red and all that, and you no, know, you know, uh, you know, doing this, you know, whole podcast world and all that. But I appreciate you, you know, reaching out and yeah, and, and, and and willing to come on the show, bro. I really appreciate that. But you know, that that's gonna cap it off for another get a bucket, you know, podcast and all that. Like I said, that's Maurice Ager. You know, uh, I'm Chris LeBron. We out. My man.